today, and uh, we'll get into uh, questions right after that. So uh, first thing I want to let you know is we have raised our interest rates on the Abra interest account yet again. So we're pleased to announce that we just raised interest rates for Bitcoin and Ethereum to 4.5%. And we've kept our phenomenal dollar rate steady at 10%. And uh, as always, the dollar rate includes all the major supported uh, stable coins. And you can continue to deposit funds via Bankwire, ACH, uh, cash at retail where supported. And of course, via external uh, crypto wallets. Uh, if you want to transfer a different crypto, for example, and then transfer or exchange that uh, transfer to a stable coin or Bitcoin or Ethereum, of course, our trading app allows you to easily do that. OK, and um, in this week's newsletter has a really cool video that we've been including as to how that all works. All right. So as some of you may know, uh, I've been on a little rant the last few days about what's going on in traditional banking and also some encouraging news that I've seen vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, some crypto banking opportunities. But as for as long as Bitcoin has existed, many banks have simply blocked their users' ability to directly transact in crypto by not allowing customers to send money to exchanges or services like Abra. And if you've been a crypto user or holder for any more than three years, I'm sure you've experienced some banking-related issue. Some banks have clearly acknowledge that customers are perfectly within their rights to purchase crypto via their bank account. But it's ridiculous that we're still having this discussion in 2020, but here we are. So just this past week, one of our awesome investors from Blockchain Capital, Brad, was doing a large bank wire into his Abra app to earn 10% on his US dollars when he was informed by his bank UBS that his account was being investigated for transacting with a crypto company. He then informed Abra that because of this investigation, he's closing his bank account, moving to a different bank, and he's going to be sending even more money to Abra. So take that, UBS. So my advice to all of you who support crypto is to simply close your accounts at crypto unfriendly banks immediately. That's what I personally have done and will continue to do. It's time to start calling out these bad actors for their behavior. According to Moon Banking, a website that tracks the crypto friendliness of U.S. banks, the worst actors are Chase, UBS, Capital One, Wells Fargo, Citi, Deutsche Bank, and there are many others. This bad actor designation doesn't necessarily mean that these banks block all crypto transactions, but how many do they have to block before they should be considered a bad actor? Most block credit cards, but support debit card transactions. I kind of get that because they are taking some fraud risk. But, you know, some will close your account for doing just a bank wire, which has no risk. A bank wire has minimal to zero risk to a bank. But some will close your account or investigate you for doing a large bank wire. That's crazy. If you support crypto as the future of banking as I do, then, you know, that is enough to warrant moving to a different bank. But where do you go? Well, fortunately... Uh, they've also outlined a few of their good actors, meaning companies that have been uh, either strongly supporting or reasonably supporting crypto as a simply allowed, reasonable uh, usage of your own bank funds. Not that that should matter to a bank. Uh, Ally, Bank of the West, Fidelity, BBVA Compass, Schwab, uh, USAA, Bank Simple, Navy, A+. These are all excellent examples of places where you can go open up an account and not have to worry about, you know, your crypto activities, which you shouldn't have to worry about in the first place. OK, but ultimately what we need are crypto centric banks. So now I realize this is a United States uh, centric uh, uh, issue, but in the US, Wyoming has been leading the charge in creating a crypto friendly banking environment. Now, I apologize to my friends from Wyoming that are watching. Uh, but let me take a step back. And so many of you from outside the U.S. may be saying, what is Wyoming? I've never heard of Wyoming. Wyoming is a is a huge landmass U.S. state with a relatively small population um, that has been very aggressive in creating new legislation to allow for crypto friendly banks in the state. And so to that end, uh, two banks have. Um, uh, announced that they have been given either licenses or provisional licenses in the states, uh, one being an existing crypto exchange and another being an entirely new bank being formed. I am definitely going to be supporting these banks 
And uh, I think it's, it's awesome what uh, the government in Wyoming is doing to try to lead the charge here. Okay, so the second thing that's come up in the last few days, and I had another kind of online exchange with um, somebody that I actually really respect, uh, Jimmy Song, who's been a fantastic evangelist to the Bitcoin community over the years. Um, and, uh, you know, he is what I would call a Bitcoin maximalist. What is a Bitcoin maximalist? Well, a Bitcoin maximalist is somebody who feels kind of a, almost a moral obligation, if you will, to basically make it clear that in their opinion, Bitcoin is the one crypto that will rule them all. As a matter of fact, the word cryptocurrency shouldn't even exist because all we need to worry about is Bitcoin. And that all altcoins are basically not worth their worth, worth their weight in ones and zeros, and will will simply disappear at some point uh, and be worthless. Now, I strongly disagree with this perspective. Not because I'm financially incentivized to do so. I simply hold more Bitcoin than I do or any other altcoin for that matter. Uh, but I still disagree with this perspective. Why do I disagree with this perspective? Well, it really comes down to one thing. In my mind, it's technology competition, which will ultimately make Bitcoin even stronger. Now, as digital gold, right, which is where Bitcoin has gone, by the way, the maximalists also believe that we have evolved past the original vision outlined in Satoshi's white paper. I don't have a problem with any of that, right? Whether I agree or not also doesn't matter. Um, you know, Bitcoin is consensus driven. And the consensus seems to be that this is what the majority want. That's totally fine. Bitcoin and, and that consensus is that Bitcoin has evolved past the original Satoshi vision such that Bitcoin itself uh, on chain does not necessarily easily support small peer to peer uh, money transfers, which is fine. Uh, others want that to go kind of off chain to technologies like Lightning. And again, I have no problem with that. But it is incumbent on all of us to not assume anything, right? And, and look at this from every perspective, right? Why might that perspective be wrong? Why might other alternatives be correct? How can Bitcoin be improved in the future? How can Bitcoin be improved in a way that is not so risky? We don't want to take big technology risks. We really don't want to take many technology risks with Bitcoin now that it's worth 200 billion, okay? And so this is where altcoins come in. Altcoins play effectively two roles as it relates to technology, in my humble opinion. One, they showcase new technologies that Bitcoin is unlikely to adopt very quickly because Bitcoin doesn't adopt anything very quickly. And again, I would posit that that's a feature of Bitcoin. The fact that it's technologically reliable because they don't push the envelope on doing things too quickly. Great. Um, lots of altcoins do that. Even Litecoin, for example, um, which I'm a big fan of, even if you look at Litecoin as a test bed for Bitcoin, that's worth something. Okay. Um, and so I use it on occasion for small dollar transfers, but I also love that the team there is willing to push the envelope and adopt technologies like they adopted SegWit faster than Bitcoin did. Uh, they adopted a bunch of technologies that are coming out in, this is not a tech show, so I'll, I'll, I won't get too deep, deep into the technology unless people ask me, ask me to in the questions, but they are adopting other technology that we're going to be seeing in Bitcoin in the coming months and years already. And that's fantastic, right? Because it says if it doesn't work, I would rather have it not work in Litecoin, honestly, no offense to Litecoin, than have it not work in Bitcoin, right? And, and that's what uh, altcoins are also doing for us. The second thing that this technology adoption is doing for us is it's showcasing potential different use cases of crypto, right? One of those use cases, which we're going to talk about uh, today is, is smart contracts, but specifically as they relate to what I call non-fungible tokens or NFTs or what the, I don't call them that, everybody calls them that, um, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Most of you know those as collectibles or, or gaming assets. We'll come back to that. But that's a, that's a use case that Bitcoin can't easily do. It can with a little bit of technology trickery, but it's not optimized for that. Um, technologies like Ethereum, 
software products like Ethereum are more optimized for that, okay? So again, these are a couple of reasons why I think that, um, why I think that altcoins and Bitcoin uh, will ultimately coexist. So ultimately, nobody knows what's going to happen when it comes to crypto, but I would be shocked if we didn't evolve to an ecosystem in crypto where dozens of cryptocurrencies coexisted to solve all sorts of different problems. Bitcoin will likely remain the stable king and best example of decentralization, and that's great. I, I've got a huge bet that that's true personally. Other projects will address different needs and take technology risks that Bitcoin either can't or are irrelevant because it's not what Bitcoin was even meant to do, such as DeFi. Okay. So as I said, uh, let, let's segue that into DeFi. So as I said last week, I think ultimately DeFi may win, but I believe that in the next three years at least, CeFi services like Abra will continue to rule. There are simply too many things that can and will go wrong with DeFi at any kind of large scale. But this kind of broad-based test, let's, let's call what's happening a huge test, that we're seeing in this new DeFi world is fascinating. It is opening up an entirely new world of possibilities and I'm really excited about it, right? Uh, now, if you're willing to put your own money to work as part of this global test, please tread carefully, right? You could lose a lot of money. You can make a lot of money, no doubt, but you can also lose a lot of money very, very quickly. Case in point, right? The rage in DeFi invest in, investing that we saw in August has cooled dramatically in September with the token space down. Now, this is as of yesterday, about 40% in September as a whole, according to this DeFi index, which is tracked by one of the uh, large exchanges out there. So, but of course, the big story of the past couple of weeks has been, been Uni, the native token of Uniswap, which after hitting a record high is, is really cooled off and then bounced back a little bit. But again, you know, tread carefully. Uh, I'm testing it. A lot of my friends are testing it out there. We're fascinated by it. It's very early. And as I've, as I've made the point before, even uh, Vitalik, kind of the you know benevolent dictator behind Ethereum, I know he wouldn't describe himself that way, has made the case that there are a lot of inherent risks with DeFi right now. And one of those risks is, is that Ethereum simply cannot scale well to meet the, the, the large demands of DeFi transactions. And we've seen that manifested itself in uh, a lot of issues with Ethereum around uh, delayed transactions, high gas fees, et cetera, et cetera. So tread carefully. But again, fascinated by what's happening in uh, the DeFi space and continue and, and will continue to be so. Okay, so we've got a ton of questions coming in. We have a winner. We, we, we're we going to be running on occasion, maybe even every week. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but we have this uh, ongoing um, uh, thing we're running where we're asking people to give us some ideas on how to make the show better. Uh, and uh, as in, in, in exchange for that, we're going to pick a winner every week based on your ideas and, and some randomness uh, for uh, a little bit of a crypto giveaway. And we do have a winner on that this week, which we will get to. And it's related to this um, non-fungible token or uh, collectible um, uh, idea that I talked about and, and specifically one of the, uh, one of the cryptos that, um, that we support. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but let me get to some of your questions. Again, you can post your questions on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitter. We will uh, we will get to all of them, I promise, uh, or as many as we can, I should say, because we've already got a, a few dozen of them uh, here uh, on the channel. Okay. All right. So uh, let me see. Let me. I've got a bunch of questions. Let me start. Let me start here. So, does proof of work make blockchain more secure than proof of stake? This is from Crypto Watch, um, and there's a, a two follow-up questions. Do I think Bitcoin ETF will ever be approved in the U.S.? And the third question is: Abra on it is Abra on its way to becoming a digital bank? Uh, wow! So, so some really great questions in there. Uh, different tracks. Let me let me address them one at a time. Do I think proof of work makes uh, blockchain more secure than proof of stake? Probably. I think when it comes to security. Uh, as it relates to crypto, it really comes down to uh, a few different things, but the, the range of, of decentralization that you can have is really one of the most important things to understand, right? I would actually ask you to uh, think about decentralization as a spectrum, meaning, uh, you know, you can have a system which is completely 
decentralized, right? And you can have a, a system which is completely undecentralized. I would say something like BitTorrent, if you've ever used the file sharing service, or maybe the internet itself is highly decentralized, meaning there's really no central off switch anywhere. If, a gov if, if the UN got together and said, our goal collectively is to shut down BitTorrent, it would be, I would claim it would be impossible, okay? Without, shutting, without every country shutting down access to the internet itself, which even that would be difficult, okay? Not, not even for legal reasons, but for technology reasons, okay? So, and, and Bitcoin, you know, is, is probably a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm going this way, so I, 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 to, to my right on that decentralization spectrum versus BitTorrent. So BitTorrent is probably a little bit more decentralized even uh, than Bitcoin. Why? Well, you know, probably because some of the mining uh, based in China is a little bit more centralized than I would like via large mining pools. I don't mind mining pools. I wish they were in more countries. I wish, you know, I, I, I wish that the Chinese government wasn't able to go in and shut down mining pools. I don't really have a big problem with that, partially because if they were to go away, Bitcoin is so compelling, I'm convinced that others would take up the slack and arbitrage that opportunity very, very quickly. But my point is, is that proof, back to the question, proof of stake is probably a little bit further uh, to the non-decentralized, more centralized solution than proof of work. But the trade-off is scalability. Okay, let's talk about scalability versus security for a second. Okay, Bitcoin by its design, and again, I love Bitcoin. I'm all in on Bitcoin financially. Bitcoin by its design is the most inefficient transaction processing system ever created by men, right? Why does that matter? Well, that's the cost of decentralization, right? It's the fact that all of these miners and mining pools and CPUs with their hashing power have to do proof of work transactions at massive scale, right? Is what makes Bitcoin secure and ultimately more decentralized. What Ethereum and other technologies have said is, is that sufficient decentralization is good enough for many types of applications, such as most smart contracts or DeFi. Okay. And that's okay. Right. So, so if we look at, for example, what's coming down the pipe with Ethereum 2.0 and its migration to proof of stake inherently proof of stake the way they're doing it will probably be considered less decentralized, meaning more centralized and probably slightly less secure than Bitcoin. But that may be OK, because sufficient decentralization is relative to the problem you're trying to solve. So to be clear, if the problem you're trying to solve is we want to create the best digital gold, which is where Bitcoin is headed now, then we should make it as decentralized as possible as secure as possible at the expense of everything else, which is why the core development team is not so concerned about network fees, transaction throughput, uh, as, the, as the team at Ethereum would be, for example, where the use case is not digital gold, but to be the world's computer. To be the world's computer, you have to be able to process lots of transactions, more than Visa, for example, because Visa is not the world's computer, it's one network, right? Ethereum's goal is to be the network. Right? So they will have to ultimately sacrifice a certain amount of centralization or decentralization, excuse me, uh, for scalability. So I hope that makes sense. There's an inherent trade-off between scalability and decentralization. And Bitcoin has made a clear claim to be the most decentralized system, and that will come at the price of scalability. Everybody accepts that. Lightning as a second layer is meant to address that, but that will be off chain. It will not be on the Bitcoin chain because the core development team has said there is no way to scale Bitcoin to those kind of transaction volumes on chain. Fine. OK, so I hope that makes sense in terms of the difference between proof of work and proof of stake as it relates to scalability, security uh, and the intersection of the two. Do I think a Bitcoin ETF will be approved in the United States? Excellent question. So I have, I have my, my opinion on this has evolved over time. Yes, I think a Bitcoin ETF will ultimately be approved. 
I think that there are certain ETF-like products out there now, for example, Grayscale uh, from um, Digital Currency Group that aren't publicly traded on an exchange uh, like an ETF that are focused on accredited investors only. Once those products become uh, even more established and proven, I can see that the SEC, the, 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 regulatory, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the regulatory body in the US, might approve an ETF for one of those companies because of their experience in reporting, uh, in uh, price dealing with addressing price manipulation concerns around crypto, uh, and having a track record of, of running a product that is effectively a security, uh, even though it wasn't uh, focused on retail investors. The difference between products that are out there now and an ETF is the focus on retail investors. And, and by retail investors, I simply mean the entire public as opposed to a small subset of the public that is wealthy enough to be allowed to transact in these products, okay? Uh, so you'll often hear this term accredited investor. An accredited investor is somebody who's allowed by the SEC to transact in products that the average retail investor is not necessarily allowed to transact in, okay? So yes, I do think it will happen. Originally, I thought it would happen via a traditional uh, ETF um, uh, you know, company, company that, that basically creates and markets ETFs. Now, I think it's more likely to happen uh, via a company that um, is already in the crypto space that's offering uh, products for accredited investors that will prove to the SEC that they have the experience, wherewithal, and understanding of how to do this uh, in a way that can also be retail investor friendly. The last of those third questions, and we'll move on, is, is Abra on its way to becoming a digital bank? Um, I, I, that's a hard question, partially because I don't want to uh, give away all of our product roadmap. Uh, we, don't, we tend to try not to announce uh, product features beforehand. Uh, I, I do think in high-level terms, we look at Abra today as a crypto bank, right? You can store crypto, you can store stable coins, you can earn interest on your deposits, you can exchange between crypto, you can send uh, fiat currencies via stable coins uh, and cryptocurrencies to other Abra users. So all of those features already kind of purport to Abra being uh, some form of a crypto bank. And the question becomes, how will that evolve over the coming year? Uh, all I can say there is it is going to evolve. It's going to be super exciting. Uh, it's what drives me. I am super passionate uh, about where this is going. Uh, I have never been more excited. Uh, I've, been at, I've been at the startup game and entrepreneurship and tech for 30 years, and I've never been more excited about an opportunity like I have been. Uh, and this includes the formation of the internet itself, right? So those of you who don't know, I, I, I was at Netscape uh, in the formative years. I worked on a lot of original internet websites, dot-com sites, early browser distribution deals. I'm more excited about this than I was about that. And I was really excited back then when I was a kid, okay? so. So this is going to be awesome. So I hope you'll all come along for the ride with us. Give us your feedback. We'd love to know what you would like to see. I have my own opinions about what I want to see and what that crypto banking service is that I want for myself. But we also want to understand what you want. And this is why I love doing this show and I love spending time on social media. Uh, not because I, I, I get off on having arguments with everyone. I love the feedback that we get on how to evolve Abra to be that crypto bank that so many of you are interested in. Okay, Crypto Watch, thank you for that. Um, okay, so uh, 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 I can't even say your name, I apologize. Warley uh, Zambales Diaz asks, uh, what are the signs that we are headed into a bull run, a bull run, excuse me, um, and the qualities of crypto projects that will last and outperform others? Uh, and then there's another question, um, which is on another topic. So let me talk about the first, the first uh, uh, point, which is, what are the signs that we are heading into a bull run? Okay, so as I, I, I say all the time, I don't give investment advice, um, you know, do your own homework, but that having been said, I'll give you my opinion, all right? So let me uh, bring up um, a, a fantastic chart uh, that I love to uh, show off, and this one basically is kind of the long-term, um, the long-term uh, pricing of, uh, there we go, uh, of uh, Bitcoin, all right? This is the dollar Bitcoin price going back 
uh, about uh, six or seven years. Let me make sure you can all see that. Yeah, you all see it. Okay, so this pattern, you see the, the peak here in the middle of the chart, that's the early 2018 price when Bitcoin hit about 20K, right? So, and then you see here, it's basically forming what we call in technical analysis, um, a descending triangle. This descending triangle is actually, in this case, a very bullish uh, continuation pattern, right? It's probably the most bullish chart from a technical analysis perspective on a long-term basis that I've seen in my entire life. I've never seen a better setup than this for a long-term explosion in price, okay? We can see that we're starting to break out and I'm pointing, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm pointing to the piece slightly above the triangle, which is where we are now. We're starting to break out of this long-term uh, ascending triangle. And I think we're gonna have a huge breakout to the upside. I mean, like I said, the formation here is incredible. You combine this technical setup with the stock to flow model that I've talked about uh, many times uh, that's been written about by Saifedean and you can listen to our uh, interview with him on, Money to, on our uh, Money 3.0 podcast. And if you haven't listened to that, interview uh, between myself and Saif, please do. It, he's, he's fantastic. He's got some crazy views, but, but his perspective on stock to flow and how it affects Bitcoin over time uh, is something everyone should understand. Stock to flow basically is the idea that um, over time, the amount of time that it will take to double the supply of Bitcoin will get longer and longer, right? So gold is considered the hardest money today because it will take decades to double the supply of gold based upon the amount we find every year. At some point, the hardness of Bitcoin will approach infinity because we simply won't create any more, all right? So, so that plus this setup tells me, uh, you know, in my humble opinion, again, not investment advice, Bitcoin is headed to the moon. Now there's another way to look at this. There's another chart I'm gonna show you. I was actually setting this up and then I found an article online that actually exactly pointed out what I was talking about. This is the log chart of the same price, right? If you look at it from this perspective, it's it's even better and really points to, uh, you know, Bitcoin getting to, again, my humble opinion, 100,000, even potentially a quarter of a million dollars over the next five to 10 years, which would be a massive, you know, 100,000 is obviously about a 10X run up, uh, 250,000, you know, 25X run up. These are huge jumps, but they are not out of the question given the hardness of Bitcoin over, over time uh, and the technical setup that we're seeing today, okay? So I hope that makes sense. It's a technical analysis, but, but, but it really does make a lot of sense when you, when you dig in to understand what's, what's behind it. It's not just, we don't just stare at charts. If you're a believer in Bitcoin, you understand what's going on behind the charts. And in this case, there's a very logical explanation as to what's happening, which when you add it all up is just, to me, it's like, wow. Right. And so the way I look at it is every significant dip in price right now, and there will be other significant dips in price for most of you actively trading. Bitcoin is not a good approach, right? The right approach is probably to buy it and hold it and wait and, and only do that with what you can afford to potentially lose in case we're all wrong. But what I'm also saying is buy the dips. If there's a significant dip in price, that's simply going to accelerate your returns later if we're right on this bet. I think we are, time will tell, okay? Uh, the other question was um, the qualities of crypto projects that will last and outperform others. This is a hard question, but a really good question. Uh, I think that the, the um, uh, there's a couple of qualities, right? I talked about this idea of decentralization. I think decentralization is the single most important quality of Bitcoin that attracted me to it in the first place. And by decentralization, as it relates to Bitcoin, originally I was talking about the double spend problem. The double spend problem says, if I create a digital currency that I can copy from person to person, how do I prevent two people from spending the same copy of the Bitcoin, right? Or any cryptocurrency. And Bitcoin solves that problem via its proof of work consensus mechanism. Now, and, and that's what actually also makes it incredibly inefficient, which is what I talked about before. Uh, but that's the price, again, of decentralization. So the question becomes, 
Are there other blockchain projects that can address decentralization in a more scalable way or can use the similar tenets of Bitcoin to create and solve other use cases? So those are the two things I look at first. Why does this technology solve other problems that maybe Bitcoin or Ethereum can't? Or what problems does it solve that maybe scales better using this new uh, project, uh, Bitcoin or, or Bitcoin fork or blockchain technology, whatever the case may be. So that's what I look at first. And if that catches my eye, I'll often dig in a little bit deeper. Okay, so I'm going to jump around here. We've got a lot of questions. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Um, so we've got a winner. Let me, let me address this first. Uh, we've got a winner. Um, I'm looking for uh, the name here. I've got so many questions. I apologize. Uh, we will we will basically reach out to you on on Twitter, uh, but um, the um, uh, the question from the winner is um, I believe Find Roman on Twitter, which is William Ward is is, is the name. Congratulations, William. Uh, we'll be contacting you uh, and please uh, respond via DM so we can get you your Bitcoin. Uh, uh, Find Roman's question, which I'll do my best to address, was. Um, and uh, was, can you please cover WAX in detail, the token WAX, I, I assume that's, and the project WAX, which is, I believe what you're referring to, and the growing gaming sector as it relates to cryptocurrency skins, NFTs, etc. Okay, fantastic question, congrats. Um, I love this topic. Uh, it is going to be a huge thing in general. Uh, and let's, uh, let's talk about it a little bit. So what is, what is WAX? All right. So, so for, actually, before we get to WAX, let me take a step back and, and explain this topic again. And I think it's going to take, um, a little bit of time. This is, this is something which is kind of hard at the beginning to get your arms around from a technology perspective. The basic idea is very simple. I want to create a digital collectible. The best example in the physical world for most people, if you have kids, You've probably heard, and the kids are older than five, you've probably heard of Pokemon, Pokemon cards. My kids are all grown, but they, they collected Pokemon cards and they loved it. They have books and books of pages uh, and they would trade them. And there was always a fixed number of cards that they could get access to. Uh, you know, not necessarily very valuable because you could go out and buy more uh, at the store, but, but to them, they were considered collectibles. Well, what if we had a, di or base, in my day, it was baseball cards, right? Um, and baseball cards actually had huge value over time for certain cards, for certain types of players, uh, because you know a, a, cer a certain amount of them were in circulation. Other examples of these type of things that people might have done in the past would be postage stamps. Uh, my grandfather, for example, was huge into, into postage stamp collecting, um, and and um, and also traditional art paintings. Right, uh, you know, a lot of uh, wealthy people love to collect art as an alternative asset class and as a store of value, actually, for the reason that. Um, specific works of art are unreplicatable uh, and will tend to go up in value dramatically versus the dollar over time. So that makes them, an, an, in theory, an interesting store of value. What if we could take all of those examples that I just mentioned and move them into the digital realm such that we had a simple and easy way to create, buy, sell, and trade any physical and virtual item? whether it be a, uh, a digital collectible, even a concert ticket, right? Or a movie ticket in digital form, such that I was guaranteed there was only one. When you say, well, how could there be only one concert ticket? Well, for a specific seat, I don't wanna be able to copy that ticket, right? Even for general admission, I only wanna have 200 of them, let's say. So all of these tokens are what we call, in the digital realm, non-fungible tokens. Bitcoin, for example, or other cryptocurrencies that are meant to act as currency are, or, or, or look like currency are meant to be fungible, such that uh, any one Bitcoin is supposed to be equal to any other Bitcoin. But in the collectible world, these tokens are, are meant to be non-fungible so that they're not equal in value to each other and they have clear distinctions as to what makes them unique, just like you would expect with any art object or collectible. So let's get back to wax. Oh, and, and, and before we get we get there, the most common example of um, how to build these non fungible uh, tokens is on Ethereum, 
and it uses this standard. Now, if you're familiar with um, utility tokens on Ethereum, you've heard of this moniker of ERC-20. Uh, ERC-20 is a type of standard for Ethereum smart contract that refers to these utility tokens uh, that you can more or less create at will. There is a similar moniker for an NFT or non-fungible token based on Ethereum referred to as ERC-721. I don't know where the numbers come from. Uh, it's probably an ordering as to when they actually create um, all of these proposals. Um, and I think ERC is Ethereum request for comments. Uh, which basically then gets kind of translated into uh, a, a standard, okay? So ERC721 is an NFT token smart contract standard. All right, let's break that down. Uh, ERC721 is simply the name of the type of smart contract. NFT is the collectible, right, non-fungible token collectible, and smart contract is just what it, is just what it sounds like. It's software that creates the token. So by and large, if you're seeing any online collectibles today, you are probably seeing a uh, ERC721 standard. Okay, great. Uh, so there are, are a few companies um, that are very early that are trying to develop platforms around ERC721. Probably the best known of those companies today, excuse me, is called wax and the wax p token is on abra and it does reasonably well uh and we love malcolm and william and the team at wax uh big supporters of theirs uh, there are many dApps or distributed applications already out there built on wax and more are coming all the time if you go to wax.io you can see all of the developer tools uh, and all of the other capabilities that they have to support this ecosystem but in a nutshell, WAX is trying to be what we call a worldwide asset exchange as and what they call the safest and most convenient way to create, buy, sell and trade physical and virtual items. Well, how can you trade a physical item using a blockchain or uh, a crypto based asset exchange? Well, it's actually relatively straightforward. You can create one of these ER7, ERC721 tokens that references an item in the real world. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who runs a business selling secondhand sneakers. Uh, it's an, uh, sneakers or you know workout shoes, uh, for those of you who don't know the term sneakers. It's a fascinating business because some of these secondhand sneakers sell for thousands of dollars. You can literally get sneakers like the ones that uh, Marty wore in Back to the Future, right? It's, it's, or original Air Jordans, for example, going back to the early 90s. It's crazy how big that business is. Now, he runs a warehouse, actually a couple of warehouses with thousands of these sneakers in them and runs online auction sites. And a lot of people don't even want to take possession of them immediately. They're not going to wear them. They're collecting them. Some want to wear them, but, but it's a kind of a retro thing. But some literally want to collect them just like art. So what they've asked him is, hey, can you continue to warehouse these sneakers? Well, that begs the question, what if the person who buys them but is warehousing them wants to resell the sneakers they've bought? Well, this is where a physical item represented inside an ERC721 token becomes really interesting because now you can actually trade your rights to that sneaker online on an exchange without having to worry about whether um, the company hosting those sneakers is aware of who bought the token. The person with the token simply needs to present the token, uh, the new token uh, to the warehouse and they should be good to go. Okay, so, so this idea of virtual gaming items I think is going to explode. Collectibles, uh, skins, um, the idea that you don't have to be inside of one central game to have gaming assets, that you can skin your phones, that you can have digital art. Think about the number of uh, LED TVs that we all have and screens that we all have um, where we can actually buy digital art and share it across screens in our homes. It's the future and it's going to be really exciting. And artists are going to have, excuse me, artists are going to have a way to monetize their work 
by creating a fixed number of art objects, similar to the way that uh, artists in the past have created a fixed number of prints of their key art objects in order to create inherent value in what they're doing. And so the goal of Wax is to create the digital instantiation of that, whether it's for gaming, entertainment, art, or any other type of collectible that developers might want to create with Wax in the future. Okay, so, all right, long, long discussion on that. Sorry for that, but it was a fascinating question. Uh, let me get to some Abra specific questions now. And by the way, we do we do trade wax on Abra. So if you're interested in holding some, you can go to Abra and and convert your existing crypto or stable coins into wax. Okay. Um, is, is, uh, um, Trevor asks, are there any advantages to holding USD versus USDC versus True USD versus Tether? Are they all essentially the same? They're all, uh, Trevor. All of those coins are essentially the same in so far as how they work, okay? Which means that a bank is holding dollars and in exchange, a certain number of these ERC-20 tokens representing those digital, those physical dollars are created and released to the people who make the initial deposits and then those people can simply use them online. Now, as it relates to Abra, we actually recommend when possible using TrueUSD or TUSD. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter, but you may save yourself a few extra steps given that we use TUSD as our default mechanism for storing dollars. Okay, so I've actually got my my Abra app, my Abra demo app here, uh, and I'll show you uh, what I mean. And oh, great, we're up and running. So this is our demo app, and you can see in the app that when I go to my interest account, I'm holding Pax, which is a stable coin. Uh, true USD and Tether, which is USDT. Now, if I want to wire money out, I can convert any of them back to my trading account to wire money out. But when I wire out, it's going to be converted to true USD first. So if I'm already holding true USD, I skip one extra step. And that may save me a few pennies, or if it's a lot of money, may even save me a few dollars on the conversion because stable coins aren't uh, one for one converted with each other, right? So you may gain money, you may lose a small amount of money. So ultimately they're all the same, but if you really care enough, you can save yourself a little bit of work by just holding true USD. Again, not a big deal. Um, they're all basically viable and, and excellent uh, stable coin products. Okay. Um, did I hear correctly, uh, Marion asks, if I deposit into Abra interest account, uh, I'm earning uh, 10%. Yes, you heard correctly. So you can see here in the app, right? I'm, I'm in my, uh, you see there's two tabs, interest account and trading account. I apologize to those of you who are on Instagram. Um, I understand that Instagram kind of centers on the screen. So you might be looking uh, at my face instead of the, the app. I apologize for that. There's not much I can do about that. Um, but um, on the app, you'll see that there's a trading account tab. I'll click on that. Uh, where these, This holds all of the cryptocurrencies that Abra supports, including stable coins. And then there's the interest account tab, okay? I'm gonna click on that tab, and you see I have my PAX, my BTC, my ETH, uh, my TrueUSD, and my Tether. To the right of that, you see the interest rates, and you'll see that on all the dollar stable coins, or, or effectively the US dollar deposits, we're paying 10% today. Those rates can and, and, and probably will change over time. They may go up, they may go down. They've been very stable. They've only gone up since we've launched the interest earning product. That's no indication of what will definitely happen in the future. But as I said, those rates have been pretty stable. I use this product. I love it. Uh, it's become a, a big part of my dollar savings uh, vehicle. And I know several Abra employees and investors are using it as well. Uh, and so we thank them, uh, of course, as well. And uh, we run a, a, a team, uh, an investment team, that puts that crypto to work to be able to earn that um, earn that interest for you in as low a risk as way as possible, okay? So the answer is yes, uh, you are earning uh, 10% and it's a fantastic product and I strongly encourage you to um, use it. Okay, um, let's see, lots of other questions here. Um, so Dragomir asks, uh, since I've been investing in Abra, the interest rates have been constantly increasing is this going to continue and what is the reason? Well, the interest rates can't go up forever, right? We can't pay you know, an infinite interest rates. 
Uh, but yes, the interest rates have gone up recently, and that is simply a function of demand. Uh, we don't simply lend to anyone. Uh, they have to pass muster with our investment committee and due diligence, and in most cases have to provide a certain amount of collateral, um, and that will determine the interest rates. But the demand that we've been seeing across the board has been high enough that has continues to support the rates that we're seeing. So there's no guarantees for the future. Um, don't expect the rates to go up forever. Uh, but the rates are holding pretty steady right now, and it's looking good. Um, but there's no guarantees for the future, um, and uh, we'll obviously give people, um, you know, a little bit of notice when the rates are changing, both up or down. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, Abra uh, Rack asks, will we, we ever work with a stable coin supported by gold besides the ones we have right now? Um, and he mentions V999. I'm not sure what that is. I think it might be a gold uh, crypto. Um, the answer is we would love to. Uh, we don't have one today because our um, our partners uh, that manage custody for both the trading and the uh, interest accounts don't support any yet. For example, Pax Gold is, is a product I'd love to bring to you. Uh, Pax G, uh, it's their uh, the company that makes uh, the Pax USD product, also has a gold product. Would love to bring that to you as soon as our partners support it. Uh, I want to make sure we support it and hopefully even for interest earning. Um, so stand by, stay tuned. Hopefully that's something that we can get to in the future. Uh, let's see. Jose Pablo asks, won't governments try to kill Bitcoin? Uh, let's see. Um, so I'm hearing some background noise on my mic here. Let me just make sure it's okay. Let me turn this game down a little bit. Okay. So hopefully this is easier to hear. So I think we're past the point that governments can kill Bitcoin. This goes back to the question that I answered earlier on that spectrum of centralization versus decentralization. And I think right now we're at a point where there really is no central off switch for Bitcoin. Even if the, uh, the Chinese government started shutting off large mining pools, others would prop up all over the world and take up the mantle. The, the arbitrage opportunity for earning money is simply too great. So I don't really have much concern uh, and that's the key, one of the keys of, 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 or key benefits of a decentralized system is that there should be no central off switch at large scale. Uh, Xgrit asks, is it a compounding interest that you gain from Abra? Uh, yes, it, of course it is a compounding because, let me go, uh, point back to my app here, which is still up on the screen. I, uh, here's my demo app. I'm gonna click on the interest earning Bitcoin. Now you can see that there's been interest paid Right, and here's examples of interest that this demo account has received. Each week's interest calculation, which is compounded daily, includes the interest that I received from the week before. In other words, I'm earning interest on my interest. So the answer to your question is yes, it does compound and it compounds daily. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to try adjusting this gain again. Hopefully, it's better now. All right. So the gain issue seems to be fixed. Thanks for that feedback. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're working in real time here, folks, so it's all good. Uh, the home studio is getting better every week. So let's see, we've got a whole bunch of more questions. I don't even think we're gonna get to them all today, but these are always great questions. I appreciate that. Two other things on the questions. Um, one, support at abra.com. If you have specific questions to your Abra wallet or account, support at abra.com is the best place to go. Uh, we do have support people here in the YouTube and Twitter and Facebook channels monitoring user-specific questions, so thanks to them. Uh, please click the subscribe button on the YouTube channel. So underneath the video, there's a button that says subscribe. That helps us promote the video on YouTube and gives us more viewership, which motivates us to spend more time, money, and resources producing this show, which is a lot of work. The Aber team puts in a lot of hours uh, to prepare the content and prepare me uh, and to put together the talking points. And so uh, you pushing that subscribe button shows us that you support us wanting to do this. And then follow us as well on Instagram and Twitter. Same message, right? It, it, a lot of work goes into this and we would really appreciate the, um, the support. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Eureka John says, hey, just wanted to shout out that uh, I got into crypto in 2018 with the Abra wallet, buying Dogecoin with it. True story, first ever crypto. 
Uh, I thought I was going to get rich from Doge. Uh, sorry if you were disappointed there. Still love Abra. Uh, Doge, not so much. Well, I think Doge was actually partially started as almost a joke. Uh, and it's hilarious to me that it's uh, continued. Uh, you know, it's like the, the, the gift that keeps on giving that it just won't die. And uh, so um, I was actually in a, the, a, a Doge camp at, uh, at, Bitcoin, uh, at Burning Man last year. Funny story. And we actually had a Doge car that looked like the, the Doge logo. So I have a soft place in my heart for the Doge community. I'm not sure I would recommend it as a long term investment, but it's a really interesting, fun uh, project to pay attention to. Um, Another question on compounding. Yes, again, reminder, we do, uh, we do compound interest. Uh, any word on Abra's participation in Flare Network's December 12th airdrop of Spark tokens for XRP holders? That's from Ray. Ray, good question. I'm getting bombarded with this question online. I don't mind it. I just don't have a good answer for you right now. When it comes to airdrops and new, new tokens, we are somewhat beholden to the custody providers that we work with we take the feedback that you give us and we give it to them and we say hey we're getting a lot of users asking for spark tokens can you please support them in your system and they'll look at them it's not easy it's a lot of work to add a new token to these custody systems so they have to pick and choose what they want to do and this is actually another question that i that i have here I actually have from two other people which is whether i can explain um, how we decide uh, which cryptos get added to Abra. And th the answer is relatively straightforward. Abra tracks pretty much everything going on out there. Uh, it's impossible. There's thousands of tokens, right? And a lot of them die off or they're not really serious projects um, or they're not really decentralized. That They may even be securities and we're not allowed to list securities or our, our, our custody partners aren't. So we have to basically go kind of step by step through this, are the tokens live from a custody perspective with our partners, both on the trading accounts, right over here on the trading side, and over here on the interest side, we have different custody partners. Are they liquid? Meaning if I add, uh, let's see, if I add BAT, let's look at the BAT chart. If I add BAT to Abra, uh, am I gonna be able to trade it? Is it liquid enough to be able to, um, to trade? By the way, BAT is up uh, 36% this year, congrats to them. So uh, if it's not, it doesn't make sense to add in the Abra app because we're simply going to have a lot of ticked off users when they try to convert Tether to BAT, for example, and there's no liquidity, which means there's nobody else selling. So if the token is listed on Abra, you can rest assured that it's reasonably liquid enough for us to be able to support. If it's not listed, it usually comes down to one of three things. It's either not provided by our custody providers it's not liquid from a trading perspective, or if the other two are true, we simply haven't gotten to it yet. Um, and those are the ones that we do add eventually that meet the other two um, criteria. And we wanna add as many as we can. And unfortunately, even the, the, the custody providers on the trading side, they'll offer tokens internationally that they don't offer in the US. Often it has to do with some compliance issue that they haven't been able to get their arms around yet. And they don't always tell us what that is, um, we could often make guesses, but um, we often don't know uh, what that is. Okay, so uh, we've got time for probably one more question. Actually, I'll take two more questions. I'll take one that's ABRA specific and, and, and one kind of industry question. Am I concerned, Catherine asks a really interesting, fascinating question. Catherine asks, am I concerned that quantum computing could destroy cryptocurrency? Catherine, great question. I'm not. And the reason I'm not is, is that the encryption algorithms uh, and the uh, hashing algorithms used in cryptocurrencies can be changed. And if we felt that quantum computing was becoming mainstream, we would simply, uh, as a community, uh, on a consensus basis, change those algorithms. We wouldn't take that lightly. They've never been changed since Bitcoin has been in existence, to my knowledge. Uh, but, uh, for example, Litecoin uses a different uh, hashing and encryption scheme versus Bitcoin. Uh, and that's great. Again, more technology competition. But we would likely migrate crypto to use encryption and hashing techniques that were quantum computing friendly so that quantum computing, quantum computing would be embraced as opposed to becoming a threat. So that's the answer there. Um, let's see. Um, I'll take one more question. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, can how do I actually... 
uh, deposit money into the ABRA interest account uh, after it's in my trading account? Excellent question. All right, so thanks for that question, Mary. So what I do is, okay, so you see I'm in my trading account on the screen. If I wanna deposit into my interest account, what I do is I click on interest account. Let's say, uh, well, let me just make sure where I have money. So I have, I have $182 in this true USD wallet that you see here at the top of the screen. Let's say I wanna take 50 of those dollars and move them into the interest account. So I click on the interest account tab right there. I click on true USD, which is the fourth one from the top, and I click on add true USD. It's gonna ask me how much I wanna move over. I can choose the entire balance, right? Or I unclick that, I'll erase this, and I'll type in 50, right? I click review, I click confirm, and voila, I have now uh, moved $50 from my trading account over to earn interest, in this case, 10% a year on my US dollar deposit as true USD. So I hope that answers your question. So um, yeah, lots going on at Abra. We've got some more exciting announcements. Some of you who are new users, uh, you're able to access our new wire system in the US. Uh, we'll be bringing that to more users in the coming weeks. We're really excited about that. We've got some upgrades coming to our ACH solution and some even more exciting stuff I don't wanna give away. Uh, including uh, changes on the interest account side, but stay tuned over the next few weeks. So it's a really exciting time for us. Uh, we've been in lockdown since March, so that's, uh, what, seven months now. The ABRA team has continued to execute flawlessly. I'm really grateful to the team. I hope all of you are as well. Give them a shout out online. They love to hear from you. Um, I can't express my gratitude enough for their efforts in keeping ABRA going. Uh, we haven't been together for seven months. We meet online all the time, uh, but uh, they've done a phenomenal job in continuing to keep the service running, bringing great features uh, and executing against our awesome upcoming roadmap. So I'm going to stop there. It's been a fantastic show as always. Uh, thank you so much for the feedback. We've had people from, I think, like 20 countries. Uh, we got to get back to uh, taking questions from specific countries next week. But thank you for your global support of Abra. Have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe. And uh, we'll see you next week after the first presidential debate. So maybe we'll have something crypto to say about Trump versus Biden. All right. So take care, everyone. Have a great weekend. Cheers.